Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 68 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of August 9th through 15th, 2012. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson. And um, as always, welcome. Uh, for the next half hour, I'm gonna be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things important to me, I think deserve your attention. Uh, comments, questions, reactions, whatever to the show can be sent to me directly at whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't get that, which I always assume you didn't, uh, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and uh, get the email address from there. I do answer my email, uh, but uh, give me a little time. And uh, please include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line so I know it's not spam. And I'll tell you very quickly, this is uh, another one of those weeks that I wish I had an hour. I couldn't get to a lot of stuff, and I'm not even sure I'm going to get to the stuff that I have. So we'll just get through of it what we can. But the first thing I wanted to mention is probably the most important. In fact, I'm sure it is. Um, something you've already heard about, but needs to be talked about more. On this past Sunday, a 40-year-old Army veteran named Wayne Michael Page walked into a Sikh temple in um, Oak Creek, Wisconsin. It's a suburb of Milwaukee, and he started shooting people. When he was done, six people were dead. Page himself, he was killed by cops in a shootout outside the temple, um, and one cop was actually shot himself several times in the course of this. So once again, we have to clean up the blood of yet another massacre. Once again, we have to console another set of grieving friends and family. And once again, we have to listen to another round of NRA-driven, corporate-sponsored, and assorted right-wing flake crap, trying every way possible to blame everyone and everything for this except the gun. Now, for example, we have Pat Robertson Pat Robertson raving about how the source of the attacks on religious sites comes from, and I'm quoting him now, people who are atheists. They hate God, they hate the expression of God, and they are angry at the world, angry with themselves, angry with society, and they take it out on innocent people who are worshiping God. In other words, atheists did it. Now, beyond the fact that no one has reported on Page's religious affiliation or lack of it, although I would bet, I don't know, but I would bet that based on what we do know about him, he would describe himself as some form of Christian. Uh, there's simple fact that it's hard to see how atheists can hate God since they think God doesn't exist. How do you hate something that doesn't exist? But then again, admittedly, Pat Robertson has been consigned even by most of the right to uh, family embarrassment territory kind of like the, the, um, the weird uncle who drives everybody nuts at every uh, family gathering with tales of how his neighbor down the street is organizing the neighborhood cats into a gang of robbers. So more importantly than people like Pat Robertson is the fact that we once again have to listen to the lone wacko, the lone wacko bull, as if guns and resolving conflicts with murderous violence was not part of our national heritage, as if it was not woven into our national DNA. Page may have been a lone shooter, but he was no lone wacko. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, which tracks hate groups, Page was a frustrated neo-Nazi. He himself told a white supremacist website in 2010 that he had been involved in the white power music scene since 2000 and in fact had formed a white supremacist racist band called End Apathy in 2005. Which means Page, he lived for years in the sewer of hate that takes up a good portion of what passes for the right of the American political spectrum today. And that fact, that living in that sewer of hate, that was equally true of most of the recent mass shooters. Now, no, I am not saying that all everybody on the right is a Nazi or a neo-Nazi. Don't be silly. What I am saying is that hatred and fear based on race, based on culture, based on religion, based on whatever it is they think makes you different, that hate and fear fill every otherwise unoccupied spot in their entire worldview. 
And at the same time, once again, we have to listen to political wimps and cowards like Barack Obama saying how, uh, oh, this terrible, tragic event calls for soul searching, but not for doing a single damn thing about how easy it is for pretty much anyone to turn themselves into a one person military strike force. This was the fifth such mass killing in Wisconsin. Uh, and Wisconsin, by the way, has some of the weakest gun control laws in the country. The fifth such mass killing in Wisconsin since 2004. According to a survey by Mother Jones magazine, there have been, including Oak Creek, nearly 60 mass gun killings in the past 30 years, one every six months on average. Now, mass killing, they defined as at least four people being killed, not including the shooter, in one event at one site. Page himself, Page himself, he used a semi-automatic handgun, which apparently is the weapon of choice for mass murders today because they are cheap, they are easy to conceal, they can be fitted with high capacity magazines so you don't have to reload very often, and of course, they're easy to come by. Page, no surprise, got his gun legally, just like the 300 million other guns out there were obtained legally. And once again, once again, once again, once again, we get, we get bombarded with the lies that people do not want to do anything about gun control. Now, it's true, it is true that if you simply ask people, do, well, do you want more gun laws, uh, the same gun laws or fewer gun laws, um, that the middle one, the about the same, gets the plurality, as it often does in such polls. Um, and if you add it together with the third choice, fewer gun, fewer gun laws, that does make a majority. But I do have to mention here, very importantly, that the fewer laws people are basically a fringe. They are at 12%. More than twice as many people, according to a Gallup poll, more than twice as many people as that want to ban handguns outright. But even now, the point is, the point here is that even now, even when advocating gun control is supposed to be a hopeless cause, a sure loser, an absolute disaster for any political campaign, even now in those surveys, 44% support tougher gun laws. Now that's not a majority, no, but it is not an inconsiderable number of people and it's much further from being a fringe position that it's normally described as being. What's more? When you shift the question to which is more important, controlling guns or protecting the rights of handgun owners, the Pew Center says that the nation is and has for the past several years been pretty much split about 50-50 on that question. And this is at a time, remember, when no one on the national scene is making the case for gun control. All we get is, oh, it's a threat to our liberty. Oh, Second Amendment. Oh, it's a threat. It's the government's going to take our guns. No one's out there making the case for gun control. Despite that, we're still at a 50-50 split. And even beyond that, when you get beyond vague generalities and start talking about actual proposals, those numbers can flip sometimes very dramatically. A poll done in May by Republican pollster Frank Luntz found that, among other things, 74% of NRA members support background checks. 68% of NRA members believe those who have been arrested for domestic violence should not have access to guns. 75% of NRA members believe that concealed weapon permits should not be available to those who have committed violent crimes. Other polls have shown uh, a majority for a ban on assault weapons, a small majority, but still a majority. And other polls have shown a strong majority in favor of closing the gun show, gun show loophole. This is where uh, sales at gun shows are regarded as private business and not subject to gun control uh, checks. The fact is we can do something about the ocean of guns out there. All we really need is some politicians with enough guts to not cower before the NRA and who would find, if they actually went out there and advocated for this, that there's more people on their side than they thought. All right, I'm going to move on to something else. Uh, Monday, 
Monday was August 6th. Now, not many people, at least in this country, take note of the day anymore. We used to, but we don't really take note of it anymore. But in Japan, they still do. Monday was the 67th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. Early on the morning of August 6, 1945, a B-29 Superfortress bomber nicknamed Enola Gay took off from Tinian Island in the Pacific, heading for Hiroshima, a city of about a, a quarter of a million people. It carried a single bomb, codenamed Little Boy. At 8.15 a.m. on August 6, 1945, Little Boy was dropped. Now, I want to take a moment to try to give you a sense of the level of power we are talking about here. That bomb contained 64 kilograms, about 141 pounds, of highly enriched fissionable uranium. Of that amount, only about seven-tenths of a kilogram, only about one and a half pounds, actually fission. That is, the atoms actually split. And of that, only about 600 milligrams actually released energy. 600 milligrams is six-tenths of a gram. It's the equivalent of about one-fiftieth of an ounce. That one-fiftieth an ounce, the energy released, was enough to do this. It had the explosive force of 14,000 tons of dynamite. 70,000 people were killed instantly. Some of them just completely vaporized. 70,000 more died by 1950 due to injuries, radiation, poisoning, and cancer. Just three days later, another nuclear bomb was dropped on Nagasaki with ten th tens of thousands more dead and another city destroyed. Now, I'm not going to get into the history of the decision to drop the bomb. It's just too long for me to do here. If you want to debate it with me, fine. Go right ahead. But I can't do it. Don't have time for it to hear. What I will say is that the bombing of Hiroshima was quite likely the second biggest war crime the United States has ever committed. A crime because the bombing was unnecessary. Before, before the bombing of Hiroshima, Japan had already offered to surrender. But there was a condition Japan wanted to be allowed to keep its emperor. So the Truman administration rejected the surrender offer because he said it wasn't unconditional. After the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Truman administration accepted a surrender offer that was basically identical to the one it rejected before, including Japan keeping the emperor. The bombings gained nothing in terms of surrender. All right, but you may think, ah, that's the past. That's 67 years ago. That's the past. Nuclear weapons aren't an issue anymore. Uh, except, of course, when it involves fear-mongering about Iran. Well, you'd be wrong. There are today eight known nuclear powers. Russia, the United States, France, China, the UK, Pakistan, India, and North Korea. In addition to this, Israel is universally believed to have at least some, a few score nuclear weapons, but just refuses to admit it. Estimates are that there are today about 4,400 nuclear weapons armed, ready to fire. Most of those are in the hands of the U.S. and the USSR, but not all of them. Add up the reserves and the stockpiles, and we are talking today about 11,500 nuclear weapons around the world. Weapons that make the Hiroshima bomb look like a pop gun next to a howitzer. This is not an issue whose time has passed. Now, as a footnote to this, I said Hiroshima was the second biggest war crime the U.S. had committed. That's because the biggest was probably Nagasaki. That was even less necessary than Hiroshima. It occurred only because the military, unwilling to wait to see Japan's reaction to the bombing of Hiroshima, was rushing to get in another bombing before an expected run of bad weather and because the weather over the primary target that day was too cloudy. That's why Nagasaki was bombed. We are going to take a break. And we're back. And back in time, just in time, for our regular weekly feature, The Outrage of the Week. Uh, a recent study revealed that more homes are underwater 
than originally believed. Now, underwater, you probably know this, but just in case, underwater means you owe more on your mortgage than the property is worth. Uh, according to the study, roughly 16 million borrowers, mortgagees, uh, owe the banks $1.2 trillion for real estate value that no longer exists. The United Steelworkers Union did a projection from that study and determined that more than 40 million people, about 13% of the population of the United States, lives in those homes. And the total mortgages total roughly $4.8 trillion. Now, one of the ideas, uh, the way of dealing with this, this problem of people in such financial distress that they, that they can't sell their homes, they can't leave their homes, they can't pay their mortgage, um, was simply principal reduction, straightforward principal reduction. Or put another way, the bank or whoever it is that holds the mortgage basically says that you forgive a certain portion of the debt. Say, you don't have to pay that part back. That reduces the burden on the homeowner. It reduces uh, monthly payments. Uh, so the home doesn't wind up in foreclosure and uh, uh, can free up money for purchases in the broader, in the broader economy, uh, which obviously has a stimulating effect on that economy. In fact, a broad uh, principal reduction program would in effect be a massive economic stimulus program. Now, most economists who don't either work for the big banks or depend on the big banks think that that's actually a good idea. And there are studies to back them up about the economic value of allowing for a principal reduction. And now the Obama gang, which so far has been somewhere between indifferent and hostile to the idea of actually helping homeowners in any practical way, well, now the Obama gang says they want to do more on principal reduction. But oh my, oh dear, what a shame, they can't. Why? because of Ed DeMarco. Ed DeMarco is the acting director of the FHFA. This is the agency which took control of the government, uh, the government-backed lenders, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, when the privatization of those outfits, which got this big bipartisan support, actually just led to a bunch of greed and incompetence. Well, DeMarco just flat out said no. There can't be any principal reduction for any mortgages held by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. He just will not allow people to get that help. Well, you can just guess uh, how the outrage response from the White House. In fact, uh, Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner, he wrote to DeMarco saying, I urge you to reconsider this decision while adding, you have the legal authority to make the decision. Boy, I bet that said DeMarco reeling. Now, DeMarco's argument, if you can call it that, comes down to an assertion that the relief via principal reduction would ultimately cost taxpayers money. Uh, even though his own agency, the FHFA, it would come out ahead on the deal, but, um, but it would ultimately cost the taxpayers money. Now, admittedly, that loss to taxpayers is possible, although, in fact, it's very hotly debated, very hotly disputed. It is possible. But as Paul Krugman pointed out, Deciding if debt relief is good policy for the nation as a whole is not DeMarco's job. His job is to run his agency. And his agency would come out ahead on this deal. Now, if the executive branch decides it's in the national interest to, to, to spend some taxpayer money on debt relief, if spending tax or money, uh, taxpayer money to provide some relief, some sense of security in their home for 40 million Americans, if they decide that's a worthwhile expenditure of money, it is not for Ed DeMarco to decide, no, you're not going to do that. So what can be done about this? Fire him. Oh, we can't fire him, they whine. Oh, he's the head of an independent, independent agency. We can't fire him. Well, first off, he's not the head. He's the acting director. You could get rid of him any time by appointing a permanent director. Oh, Obama couldn't get his nominee through the filibusters or us Senate? Then do a recess appointment. Or don't fire him, transfer him. Send him to the bureaucratic equivalent of outer Slobovia.
Don't try to tell me that this one guy can sit and block an entire federal program just because he wants to stomp his feet and say no and that he's untouchable. Don't try to tell me that. But the fact is, nothing is going to happen. Nothing's going to happen to this. Nothing's going to happen to that guy. Why not? I'll tell you why. Because when the TARP program was first getting started, Tim Geithner was, who said, oh, please reconsider your decision, he was making exactly the same arguments that Ed DeMarco is making now. In refusing to help homeowners, Ed DeMarco is not challenging what has been the Obama administration's policy. He's expressing it. And that is an outrage. All right, something else. Another thing to get upset with, the Clarabella Award. Again, uh, Clarabella Award given as necessary for acts of meritorious stupidity. This week it's a group award, but uh, first I have to give you some background. There's this guy, Joseph Ross. He's a, he's a, a black man. He lives in Dayton, Ohio. And the first weekend of August, he went to Sharonville, Ohio, on his way to Cincinnati, where he intended to uh, attend the Basie's Jazz Festival. Uh, he checked into a Motel 6 in Sharonville, went to his room, turned on the TV, and they had one of those screens that always comes up with the first thing you turn on TV in a motel room with, you know, the services and what channels you can get and so on. And along with that is a nice greeting for him. It says, and I quote exactly, hello, nigger. Well, he complained to Motel 6 corporate offices and the Dayton chapter of the NAACP, and note this well. WCPO, a TV station in Cincinnati, got video of the screen showing the message, okay? The police are also investigating the incident. They say they're taking it seriously. The corporation released a statement deploring the incident while very carefully noting it was an isolated case. Uh, and the motel gave him a better room. Okay, that's the background. So who are the clowns here? The people who commented online about this story. There are like 15 pages of comments. I only went through about the first five and discovered a significant portion of the people who commented on this story are worse than clowns. Here are some examples. Again, this is from the first couple of pages. A number of them attacked the Huffington Post for running the story. Apparently been up a couple of days. They attacked him for running the story. And one, of the, one person said, why are they running the story? They will run it as long as they feel it will bring the country closer to a race war. Of course, that is the NAACP's agenda also. Someone else, there's a lot of attacks on the NAACP too. One of them said it's nothing more than a black version of the KKK. You might be surprised, or actually maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but you might be surprised at how many people were like, they call, this, they call each other by this name, by this word all the time. What's the problem? One person said they actually thought it was pretty friendly of the place to greet him. Several people said they thought it was funny, even hilarious. And you're getting upset over nothing. Apparently, the, the, the concept of context is beyond these people's mental abilities. Other people said, oh, it's just the liberal press trying to stir things up. And somebody said, oh, yeah, I'm telling you, racism has been rampant ever since the president came into office. And that one actually got a good rejoinder. Someone said, yeah, President Washington. A lot of people said they just didn't believe it. Now, remember, there's video of the screen. OK, remember that. But many said they just, they just don't believe it. Oh, by the way, this this is a picture of Joseph Ross. This is what he looks like. Somebody said he is just very unappreciating. Look at him. We can see he came from a shelter. Damn, they just don't know how to act when greeted. Several claimed it was a setup to, to, to shake down Motel 6. One guy said, this guy, it was one, it was a setup from day one, as he just happens to know an employee there. Somebody asked him how he knew that, never got an answer. Somebody said he's in it for the money grab. Um, but this one, this one capped it all. This is an exact quote. Yes, I think it was one of his buddies who put it there. I cannot see a white person doing it. What would be the purpose for a white to do it? You know, I wonder how you can have the mental 
ability to manage a keyboard and yet still be so out of touch with the world around you as to be able to spew such complete nonsense as that. These people, en masse, they are racist clowns. All right. After all that, I have to lighten things up the last couple of minutes here. Time for our occasional feature and another thing. This one, about curiosity. Curiosity, the largest and most advanced spacecraft ever sent to another planet, landed safely on Mars Sunday night, Monday morning, however you do it, without a hitch. It now begins a planned two-year mission uh, focused on the question of if there ever was or however improbable it may actually be, if there is life on Mars. It actually joins a colleague on a distant part of the Martian surface, the rover Opportunity. Uh, Opportunity is now in the eighth year of what was planned as a 90-day mission. Have that same kind of luck with Curiosity. Uh, Curiosity may still be running when, if if uh, the, the current plan is to land somebody on Mars in, during the 2030s. And if we had the same kind of luck, curiosity may still be running. All right, two quick things I want to mention. One is that when you see the video, as I'm sure you have, of, of all the applause and cheers in the control room, a touchdown was confirmed. One of the things you should remember, a lot of the people in that room worked, have worked literally for 10 years for that moment. So you can really understand how excited they were. And two, I have to show you this. This is one of the most extraordinary space photographs, in my opinion, one of the most extraordinary space photographs I've ever seen. This was taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is a satellite we have. We have two satellites in orbit around Mars right now. Uh, one of them actually relayed signals from, uh, from Curiosity back to Earth so that we, they knew what was going on. Uh, the other one, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, down in the lower right corner, you see that little white box? That is a photograph of Curiosity going down to Mars on its parachute. I just, I just think that is such a remarkable, remarkable photograph. Um, okay, I'm gonna wrap up with one last thing. Just a quick personal thing here. Uh, Mary Tam died last week, uh, died of cancer at the age of 62. Uh, again, it's somebody you probably don't know. She was actually a, a British actress, did a lot of, uh, did, did some movies, uh, did a lot of British television. But uh, to some of us, she is best known as the first Romana uh, in Doctor Who. She was the first Romana. Her actual name was Romana Baracha Lunder, but Romana for short, because according to the doctor, it would take too long to say her name in the case of danger. All right, anyway, that's it for me. I think I'm going to wrap up there. I got a lot of stuff uh, next week. I got other stuff that I really want to cover. But for right now, I think I'm just going to wrap it up there. And uh, I'm just going to say you just, you just have the best week you can. And uh, we will see you next week.